Ahoy! And welcome to Prague. And welcome to another episode of the Mast Guide. And also welcome to the world-famous Prague astronomical clock, known in Czech as the Orloj. In this episode, we're going to look at some stories associated with the clock, the history of the clock, and how the look at the clock has changed over the centuries. And in the next episode, we're going to look at how to read the astronomical clock. And by the end of that episode, you should be able to look at a picture, any picture of the astronomical clock, and from that determine the day it was taken, the month it was taken, the time the photograph was taken, how many hours of daylight are left in a day, and the approximate sunset for that time of day. So, already people are beginning to gather here, so let's get on with it, shall we? And this is what they've come to see. So when I ask my tourists, who have stood here for some time, to see this wonderful, marvellous spectacle, what they actually think of the clock, they kind of fall into two camps, two ends of the spectrum. I have people who say, wonderful, marvellous, beautiful. I have people at the other end who say, disappointing, underwhelming. I wasted 30 minutes of my life. This has apparently been voted one of the most disappointing tourist attractions in the world. Now, I think that's a little bit unfair, as hopefully we'll discover as we actually go through this video. But I say, OK, can you think of some other disappointing tourist attractions in the world? And invariably, I get things like the Little Mermaid, the Mannequin Piss in Brussels, the Eiffel Tower, Stonehenge, just a bunch of stones, the pyramids. A more organized bunch of stones and also the Grand Canyon that beautiful natural formation I was doing a tour here uh, about three years ago and I said that the Grand Canyon and I had a young American lady at the back of my group and she shouted out I'd agree with that the Grand Canyon's just a big hole in the ground so well, the point I'm trying to make is that some people think it's absolutely marvelous and wonderful some people actually find very disappointing now the story goes that this beautiful clock was completed in 1490 by a man known as Jan Rusch, otherwise known as Master Hanusch. And it's said that when he completed this magnificent clock behind me, he was invited to a special celebratory banquet given by the city elders to say thank you for creating something so beautiful and magnificent. Now he was very much enjoying himself, the food was good, the drink was good, but as the evening went on, he noticed that the city elders who had invited him were leaving the room one by one, till eventually he was all alone. Suddenly, the door burst open and in came two men, one with a red-hot poker, the other with a large knife. They tied him to a chair, they stabbed out his eyes, and they cut out his tongue. Phew! That's gratitude for you, isn't it? Ouch! Now, I asked my tourists, why do you think they did that? And sometimes they say, is it because he complained about the soup? No, the reason being, it said, was the city elders wanted to make sure that this was the only example of this clock in the world and nowhere else. But Jan was going to get his revenge because a few days later, when he was feeling a little bit better, he managed to get into the door behind me which leads up to the clock mechanism. Now, security wasn't a difficult in those days. There was no voice or iris recognition. He knew where the clock mechanism was. He felt for the clock mechanism, bit of blind acting going on here. And he knew that in front of the mechanism was a little raised area. And it said he went back as far as he could and he ran towards the clock. And when he got the raised area, he launched himself into the clock, killing himself and damaging the clock so badly that it didn't work for another 150 years. Great story, but it's only a legend. Now, the Prague Astronomical Clock is one of the oldest clocks in the world with a miraculously preserved clock mechanism, and that's only because it was lucky. In the 18th century, when they came to do the renovations behind me for the old town hall here, the clock had not worked for some time, and somebody thought it might be a good idea to sell off this rusting, unworking piece of metal for scrap. Luckily, it was saved. But still, things didn't go smoothly. Uh, the clock was only rarely wound up and only run on some days, such as Saints' Days. As this contemporary picture from 1856 shows, 
By the middle of the 19th century, the clock was in a very sorry state and needed to be repaired. Also, as I pointed out in the first video, the clock was destroyed during the final days of World War II. But, thankfully, the mechanism survived, though everything else had to be rebuilt. So this remains the oldest working astronomical clock in the world that still has some of the original mechanism from when it was completed around about 1410. So, if Master Hanosch did not build this clock in 1490 and it was built in 1410, who is responsible for the building of this clock? In the 16th century, the clock was maintained by the clockmaker Jan Tauborski. He looked after the clock from 1552 to 1556 and then from 1560 to 1570. He left behind a handwritten book of 16 parchments describing his problems with the clock, all the repairs and new additions he had made to the monument. It is thought that Taborski might be responsible for the myth I told you previously about Master Hanosch, otherwise known as Jan Ruja, and the reason being is that he wanted to accredit the design and the build of the clock to someone. Certainly Master Hanosch was involved in the construction of the calendar dial, but it's unlikely that he was the clock's designer. Nonetheless, the historian Boleslav Balban seized upon this and is partly responsible for the legend I told you about previously. It was thought that the clockmaker responsible for the mechanism was a guy called Miklos of Kadjan, although some dispute that he was solely responsible for the clock, since it has been suggested that Jan Schindel, the then professor of mathematics at Charles University and physician to Wenzel IV, was a possible collaborator. Others think that perhaps Schindel wasn't involved at all, and that as an educated, skilled man, Miklos was capable of doing it alone. Otherwise, he would not have got the job. Nonetheless, the evidence shows very clearly that Nicholas Kadjan was indeed the clockmaker responsible for the building of this beautiful and magnificent astronomical clock. And for his work, he was paid very handsomely. He received a house, he received a very generous lump sum, and also an annual stipend for the rest of his life. As you can see, there were a number of changes and additions to the clock over the centuries. The skeleton, or death, was the first of the moving figures to be added to the clock, probably in the 15th century, and possibly by Master Hanusch. In Czech, the skeleton is known as the klapáček, which means clatter or chatter, because his jawbones clattered, although today that too has been replaced. Then there was the change to the zodiac circle. The original zodiac circle showed the animal signs of the zodiac and was replaced with a wheel only showing the signs of the zodiac, as well as 72 divisions of the wheel, which helped to identify the day and the month. And finally, the golden cockerel was added in 1882, and it signifies the end of the walk of the apostles. And speaking of the apostles, when you see the clock running on the hour, the apostles will appear presented to you from two different windows. Six disciples on one side, six disciples on the other. It is thought that the apostles were added to the clock sometime between 1680 and 1733, following the ascension to the throne of the Habsburg King Charles VI, and as a way to reaffirm Catholicism as the country's one and only true religion. Some of the apostles seem to have disappeared by the middle of the 19th century, but were restored during the repairs of 1864 to 1865, and then completely replaced by the sculptor Wojciech Suhada, who we're going to come back to later, after the almost complete destruction of the clock in 1945. The statues were dressed in oriental clothes and not in the style of the clothes of the time, so as not to be considered as some kind of satirical comment on the leaders of the time. The statues, both moving and stationary, have been added to, changed, and their meaning changed too. In the top row are the sins, today, vanity, greed and hedonism, lust or pleasure if you will. And in the bottom row the figures represent good, opposite virtues like a scribe, an astronomer and a chronicler. Hmm. More like occupations rather than virtues. And this is thanks to the work of Wojciech Suhada. He was a sculptor and a maker of puppets. He made some changes to the statues in 1911, but after the major reconstruction in 1945, he went to town. And in 1966, he made even further changes. So originally, pride, greed and envy became vanity, greed and hedonism. And kindness, charity and humility became a scribe, an astronomer and chronicler. 
In this short film shot in 1966, Suhada describes how and why he changed the names of the figures or the statues. One statue had a pen and a document, so he called it a scribe because we're next to the old town hall. He gave a book to the chronicler because Prague has a very long history. To one of the statues, originally Envy, he thought he looked happy, so he gave him an instrument. Another character he turned into the astronomer by giving him a telescope, the instrument, the tool of the astronomer, and having him look up at the astronomical clock. In another example of how he upset those who believed in preserving the clock's history, Suhada wanted to remove the shield from the Archangel Michael for the very simple reason he didn't like it. Today we can see the statue of the Archangel Michael, who is a protector. Previously in this location was a statue of an old man with a hunched posture, who represented Kronos, the personification of time. Yet the only evidence there seems to be for this is a painting from the 18th century Czech painter Kudvik Kuhl. In his painting of the old Times square that dates from around 1730, if you squint, you can see in the distance in front of the clock a kind of a hunched figure that is just visible. And that, it's said, is the statue of Kronos. Apparently the statue was in such a bad state that it had to be replaced and so they replaced it with a model or the statue of the Archangel Michael. This statue originally stood on the town's guardhouse, the southern guardhouse, but when the guardhouse was demolished the statue was moved to the astronomical clock. The addition of the statue of Archangel Michael to the astronomical clock was important because for many years the scepter of Michael pointed to the days of the week and also the saint of the day on the calendar dial. The calendar dial was changed during the refurbishment of 1864 to 1865 and the calendar dial was painted by the very famous Czech painter Josef Manas. In the centre of the dial is the coat of arms of Prague. Surrounding that are the signs of the zodiac and then surrounding that are scenes from Czech lands at different times throughout the year. So the calendar dial is divided into 365 days and represents an entire year. And you've got different colours on the calendar dial. Uh, the black ones indicate the names of the saints, which people in the Czech Republic are named after, and also in red, which indicates special saints days or festive days. The calendar dial used to be turned at midnight every day manually, but now it's done automatically. It also, instead of using Archangel Michael to point his scepter, this was replaced by a golden arrow at the 12 o'clock position. Behind me is the calendar dial, and written on the calendar dial are the names of 365 Catholic saints. Now until very recently here in the Czech Republic, if you wanted to name your child, it had to be a name from this list. So if you wanted to give your child an unusual name, like, uh, you know, today, celebrities have a habit for giving their children unusual names, like, like Strawberry, or Prosecco, one of my favourites, or even Elvis, it was very difficult to do so. But I'm pleased to say, Things are changing, because about three years ago I did have a young Czech Elvis coming on a tour with me, and what a very nice young man he was too. So there we are, a brief introduction to the wonderful and marvellous astronomical clock of Prague. I hope you appreciate that I've not been able to cover everything in that time I have for this video, and if you are interested and want to find out more, you can look at the links and the references in the description below. And if you have enjoyed coming round with me, on this episode then please don't forget to subscribe by clicking the subscribe button and pressing the little bell for notifications so on to the next episode how to read the astronomical clock